So, I trust and hope uh, you got some rest. Last night, uh, we got a little bit over there at the Bancroft household. I uh, really appreciated uh, all of your hospitality uh, toward me, and, and uh, it's been a joy to be here with you. I really enjoyed our time together last night, and looking forward to uh, another good day today. I talked to my wife this morning, uh, called her, and she was outside shoveling snow. Uh, got about five inches last night, and there's a layer of ice underneath it. And so she and my son are out there chipping away, and uh, so I feel kind of bad. I missed the, uh, made, made her uh, shovel without me. But uh, um, I, I did the rest of the winter, so she can, we'll get this one time in there. A couple of years ago, I broke my ankle tore at the shreds playing basketball, and uh, I was on crutches the whole winter. Uh, I had surgery at the beginning of December and got off crutches at the end of March. And so we, we don't have a snowblower, where I think we're the only ones, in, only ones I know don't have a snowblower, and I just said, well, you know, it's good exercise. And that winter, my poor wife and son are out there, you know, just shoveling away all winter long. So, uh, but we don't have to quite face that this morning here, so. I want to start off, I have some books uh, I want to hand out, and uh, I'll start by uh, a little quiz from yesterday. We'll see who was paying attention last night. You don't get to look back at your notes, okay? Um, if you could tell me, uh, somebody tell me one, one, one another command from Scripture uh, and a, a reference for it. Oh, oh what is that? <laughs> oh... We actually got to know where it is in the Bible. I can't just make it up. Hey, can anyone tell me uh, a one another command from Scripture? First John 7 and 8. Uh, love it, let's love one another. First John 4, 7 and 8, right? We'll throw the 4 in there, right? Good. He, uh, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. By the way, anyone read Trusting God by Jerry Bridges? Excellent book. Anytime anyone's going through any sort of suffering, trial, struggle, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. There you go. How about another one? Anyone else give me one? A one another command from Scripture and a reference for it. Ephesians uh, 4, 29. Mm -hmm. Be kind and passionate to one another. Tenderhearted, forgiving one another. It's actually Ephesians 4, 32, but we'll give you credit for that one, okay? <laughs> uh, living a life of hope. Uh, Nathan Busnitz, uh, and part of what we're going to talk about later today is uh, when, we, when we're around one another, we want to be giving one another hope. There's really hope. There's hope for your trial. What, whatever you're going through right now, there is real hope. Okay? Good. Uh, how about one more? One more. We run out all the like, one another commands? Is that what we're saying? Yes. It's Hebrews 10, <laughs> but uh, there may be a similar... What's that? Other than that, you nailed it. You know, just because I, I feel bad for you. I, uh, he's getting the book, uh, Competent to Counsel by Jay Adams. If you've heard the name Jay Adams, he's uh, kind of one of the stalwarts in uh, biblical counseling. And uh, that book talks all about uh, counseling and, and uh, what it's all about, using the Word of God. So... Uh, that's, that's all we'll do right now. And let's get into session three. What we're aiming for. Troy, what's the time, what's the time reference on this one? I'm sorry. What? Okay. Good. Targeting the heart. So when we, when we talk about this whole idea of admonishing, encouraging, instructing one another, uh, what is it that we're really trying to get at? Where, where are we trying to go with this? And I would submit to you where we're trying to go with this is, is the heart. And so we want to talk a little bit about a biblical perspective on the heart. How does the Bible describe the function of the heart? Now, of course, you know we're not talking about the organ that pumps blood. Uh, but 
the, uh, the, the biblical writers would uh, locate or uh, assign uh, an idea of human behavior or human uh, functioning, and they would often locate it in using the same terminology as a human organ. So we talk about emotions. Uh, they refer to those as the bowels, right? The bowels of compassion and uh, the human heart. The Bible uses the term heart to refer to the, the innermost person, okay? And that word heart is extremely important in Scripture. It shows up 726 times in the Bible, 608 in the Old Testament, 118 in the New Testament. So if you read through Scripture, you'll find a lot of references to the heart of man. How does the Bible describe the function of the heart? The heart is who a person truly is. Okay? Who a person truly is. We know this reference from 1 Samuel 16, right? Where uh, God is talking to Samuel and says, Samuel, you, man, looks on the outward appearance, but I see the heart. Uh, it's not so much that God sees inside the, the innards of the person. That's not the idea. The idea is I see who someone truly is. You can change your appearance, but I see what's going on inside. First Kings 8, then here in heaven, your dwelling place and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know. This is a prayer. Render to each whose heart you know according to all his ways. For you, you only know the hearts of all the children of mankind. God, you know what's really inside. You know who a person truly is. The heart is also the moral and spiritual center of your being. The moral and spiritual center of your being. Deuteronomy 4.29 But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find Him. If you search after Him with all your heart and with all your soul, with all of who you are. 1 Samuel 12, And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil. Yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. The moral and spiritual center of your being. In Luke 12, of course, Jesus said, For where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. Where what you're treasuring, what you have your eye on as being important, your heart will follow. Your, your spiritual and moral center will follow right after that. Okay, we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. The heart is the center of rational and spiritual life. The decision-making and determining locus of a person. Now you'll know in this, notice in the same line there, I have rational and spiritual. You can't separate those two. The will, the decision making, I'm, I'm going to decide to go this way, and the spiritual are linked together. They're not two separate things, right? I, I make a choice to follow after. I make a choice to worship. 1 Kings 11. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart, turned away his heart, he decided to go after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. <coughs> Solomon's wives turned him away from following God. The heart is the center of thought and forming concepts. Deuteronomy 29, but to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. A heart to understand. Thought. 1 Kings 3, Solomon in his good days, when he actually was still humble, he asked the Lord, the Lord said he could have one thing, and what does he ask for? Wisdom. He actually says, give your servant an understanding heart to govern your people. Your version may say mind. It's actually the same word as heart. An understanding heart to govern your people. I want to, I want to understand. I want to know. Nehemiah 7. Nehemiah speaking here. Then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles and the officials and the people. 
This was a thought God had given him. Okay, now you may be saying, well, how is that different from the mind? Don't we, have, we don't, don't we have heart and mind? Don't we see, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? What Jesus is doing there isn't dividing people up into four parts. There's a heart, there's a mind, there's a soul, and a strength. What he's saying is with all of you, all of who you are. Okay, and you see these concepts overlapping in Scripture. Heart, mind, soul, spirit. You see them all overlapping in Scripture. Okay, but who you are and what you think what you dwell upon, that is your heart, okay, according to Scripture. The heart is the center of our affections and our desires. The center of our affections and desires. Psalm 37, 4, who can quote it? Starts with delight. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself, put your affection upon the Lord, and He will grant the desires resonant in your heart. Isaiah, uh, Psalm 40, verse 8, I desire to do your will, O God, your law is within my heart. And of course, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus keeps taking everything back to the heart, doesn't He? Everything back to the heart. I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's the locus. That's the seat of desire and affection. It's in the heart. The heart is the center of moral life. The center of moral life and therefore the seat of sin within man and the operative center of the conscience. So now when we start talking about sin, start talking about guilt, it's located right there in the heart. 2 Samuel 24, but David's heart struck him after he'd numbered the people. He felt guilty in the heart. His heart struck him after he had done something that was prideful. The heart's the center of the moral life. That's where sin is going to, that's where sin is resident. Matthew 15, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, fault with, false witness, and slander. And as we mentioned briefly last night, that destroys the whole idea of just follow your heart, right? Just follow your heart. Listen to your heart. Way too many folks have listened to their heart, Right? How many marriages have been ended by someone who listened to their heart? But I, my heart just tells me I, I, I should be with him, not my husband. Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, this is the Jews Peter's uh, preaching to, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They were, they were convicted. There was con their conscience was cut. In the heart. First John 3, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So you see, if we want to uh, summarize, okay. Somebody tell me here, what's, what's happening? Hey, all right, good. I don't know what I did. There we are. Okay. The, so I have there in your notes, the heart is the center of the entire man, the very hearth of life's impulse. So we got the idea, right? The scripture locates all of these things, our thoughts, our will, our affections, our worship, our desire, all of it in the human heart. Now it's important we're not, we don't try to split these up into separate uh, happening in separate places. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but there's a tendency to want to think, well, I get it with my mind, I don't get it with my heart. The Bible doesn't really let us go there. This happens all together, all in the same place, all within. Okay, So let's talk about the importance of the heart. We're to guard, keep watch over, protect, cultivate our hearts, because what goes on in the heart determines our lives. Proverbs 4.23 Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it, flow the springs of life. 
Proverbs 4.23 is often a, a verse to go to early when you're talking with someone who may be going through difficulty and may be tempted to respond improperly to what, whatever that difficulty is. Guard your heart, okay? How you move forward in this, whether you're going to please the Lord in this, is going to be determined on whether you guard your heart. Guard your heart from, from uh, bitterness. Guard your heart from some form of idolatry. Guard your heart from any sort of aspect of sin. I've, I've talked to some people, gone to Proverbs 4.23 and said, uh, you need to pay attention to what's going on in your heart. And you need to identify where there's sinful desire there in your heart. Okay, if you stray from the Lord, it's going to affect your life. Uh, I'm working with uh, one couple, and uh, the wife, she really, really, really wants her husband to pick it up in some areas. You know, like, hey, I'm there, right? <laughs> Every wife's like, yeah, right. Uh, but she, she is, wants a, a house that is clean, uh, really clean, and she really wants her husband to, uh, uh, to come alongside and, and see, uh, see to the same degree she does. She, she wants him to really step up in that way. She wants him to, uh, to love her, and one of the ways of loving her would be being as maniacal about having a clean house as she is, okay? And I could talk to her about, uh, just about ways to sort of help this situation. I could talk to her about ways to talk to her husband. Uh, I could talk to her about uh, strategies to get him to be cleaner, you know, whatever, right? The whole time just bypassing the whole issue of her heart. That this idea of her house being immaculately clean is just driving her heart, right? I could give her behavioral principles, better ways to talk to her husband. But the real issue going on here is that her heart is lusting after something. And what her heart is lusting after is a house that looks like, you know, she could show it off to any one of the neighbors. Isn't that the real issue, right? That's a much bigger issue than just communication principles or just, you know, honor and respect your husband. That's important, but there's a bigger issue here and that is what's really going on in her heart. One of the problems with how we often address our internal struggles is a radical separation between heart, mind, spirit, etc. And this shows up when we try to address the emotions separately from the thinking. Right? How many, how many times have you either heard this, or if we want to be really honest, how many times have we thought this or said this? Well, I know that's true, but this is the way I feel, right? I know this is true, but I just feel this way. Or I really can't help it, I, this is the way I feel, right? As if you're, you have no control over your emotions, as if the emotions are found somewhere else. That's why it's important we realize all of these things find their seat in one place, that is, in your heart and who you are. And yes, you are responsible for your emotions. You are. So we can't separate out emotions from thinking and willing and desiring. We can't separate the emotional from the mental or spiritual. These are linked together because they all flow out of what is taking place in our hearts. The whole saying, I know it in my head, but not in my heart, it's really not quite accurate. What often is going on there, it's not a matter of I know it in my head, I just don't, it's just not, it hasn't reached down into my heart yet. What really we mean is, I know what the Bible says, but I don't fully believe it. Let's be frank, right? And, and listen, I, I'm a sinner. I'm standing up here in front of you as a fellow sinner. So that very thought has run through my own mind. But I can't get away with it, and neither can you. The fact is, I don't fully trust God. But God says, I will protect you. And I say, yeah, I know that in my head, but it hasn't found its way, in, its way into my heart. No, no, no. I know what the Bible says. I'm just, I haven't fully submitted myself to it. I don't fully trust God with it. That's what's really happening. Okay. So this is all located within our 
hearts. And in light of what we've been saying about the heart then, let's talk about uh, James chapter 4. Why don't you turn to James chapter 4. And we want to talk about the problem of desires. James 4 is a great place to go anytime there's a marital conflict, some sort of relational conflict. I mean, James is about as practical as it gets. Uh, he just comes right out there and is like, you got conflict going on. Let me talk about it, right? This is not highfalutin theological stuff. This is the, the nitty gritty. And actually, James 4 is a good place to go really for any issues because the principles found there apply to uh, all sorts of different uh, struggles that we have, not just relational. So James chapter 4, verse 1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions or your desires or your lusts are at war within you? So when we look at our lives, we can often see conflict and trouble. So James writes to his uh, his uh, audience and he says what's the source of the problems that are among you? What is the source? We often see conflict and trouble in our own lives and James is going to address that. And he says the root issue behind these problems is our desires. The root issue is our desires. And look at verse 2. You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet it and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. James says the desires of our heart direct our behavior. So you get where James is going here, right? You've got conflict. What's the cause of your conflict? Your desires. Well, how does that cause conflict? Because from those desires comes your behavior. You're acting according to those desires, right? That's what James is saying. Our behavior manifests itself in thinking, speaking, and acting. It is very difficult to act against your desires. And I would submit to you, this is the way I think of this, I think it's impossible to act against your most prominent desire. It's impossible to act against your most prominent desire. Let me give you an example. So, uh, supper's done, you had a nice full meal, uh, you ate steak, mashed potatoes, green beans, whole deal, nice meal. Uh, <laughs> Eric's amening, right? Steak, mashed potatoes, and green beans. I'm from Ohio, you know, it's a good mis Midwest kind of meal, sort of deal. Uh, and afterwards, then, there's the, there's the option of dessert. Now, you have been trying to lose weight, you're hoping in the next uh, two weeks to shed 10 pounds. Okay. That's a little scary. Let's back that up. Five, let's say, yeah, uh, done. Five pounds. Five pounds in the next two weeks is, is your goal. So as, you, as, as the chocolate cake, mounded with frosting, maybe a couple cherries on there too, is slid across the table at you, offered to you, there is a desire to eat chocolate cake. Amen? Amen. Yeah. There is a desire to shed some weight that you've been hoping to, to shed. <laughs> no amens on that one. Uh, they were quiet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is your most prominent desire at that moment will dis determine what you do, right? If at that moment my desire to eat chocolate cake is, more, is stronger than my desire to shed weight, I will eat the chocolate cake. If my desire to, sh to lose weight is greater than my desire to eat chocolate cake at that moment, then I'll, I'll pass. Now, that's a silly little example and not a, a sin example. But, but here's my point. At that moment, what do you desire? The most prominent desire in your heart will be the way you go. It will determine your choice. So at that moment, if we talk about temptation, faced with temptation, when the temptation is in front of me, if my greatest desire in my heart is to honor my Lord Jesus Christ, who died for me, I will reject the temptation, right? 
if the greatest desire of my heart at that moment is to get revenge, have my way, not be humbled, or whatever it is, fulfill some pleasure, I will choose that. And what James is saying is, the source of your conflicts and the problem is the desires that are within you. And when those desires rise up and you act according, accordingly, then you're going to behave certain ways and that behavior is going to cause problems for you. And this context is primarily relational conflict, but it also happens for any desires. One saying I like, we do what we do because we want what we want. We do what we do because we want what we want. And our desires, verse 3, are often sinful. Our desires are often sinful. That's what he says in verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So you have these sinful desires. You're, you're, you're wanting things. You even maybe even ask the Lord for things. But you don't receive them because you're asking wrongly. You're asking for something uh, to, to fulfill sinful desire. Well, how do we know desires are sinful? Well, they're sinful when you desire something that God forbids, right? I mean, some, some desires very clearly are sinful. But desires are also sinful when we want something that God doesn't forbid, but we want it too much. It's an inordinate desire. And this is really, we all struggle with sin in, in various forms. But for Christians, this is often where we find ourselves. We find ourselves desiring something that in and of itself isn't sinful. But we desire it so much that it becomes the most prominent desire, more than my desire to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Easy example happens all the time is in marriage, right? I want my wife to respect me. How many husbands would say, I want my wife to respect me? Of course. Is that a sinful desire? No. It is not sinful to want your wife to respect you. Every wife would say they want their, their husbands to love them. Is that a sinful desire? Of course not. However, if the greatest desire of my heart is to have my wife respect me, oh boy, right? What might that lead to? That might lead to me being demanding, uh, unloving, uh, I may sin in anger when she doesn't respect me. If my desire to be respected as a husband ever gets higher than, more prominent than, my desire to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, then there's sin coming. Sin is coming, right? Same thing. A wife who wants to be loved more than she wants to honor Christ, sin is on the way. When these desires get out of hand, Okay? It's what we refer to as idols of the heart. Idols of the heart. Desires that have gotten too prominent. They are competing with Jesus Christ for our allegiance and our worship. How do I know if I desire something too much? Well, here's a three little tests you, you could run it through that I, I, I like. I'm willing to sin in order to get it. I know uh, there's, uh, desire is too strong in my life and I'm willing to sin in order to get it. If I'm willing to sin in order to get my wife to respect me, it has become an idolatrous desire. Or if I sin because I didn't get it. Right? She didn't respect me, so I responded sinfully. That desire was greater than my desire to honor Christ. Or it's something I dwell on excessively. I dwell on excessively. It's the meditation of my heart. I'm always, I'm always meditating on this desire. Can you guys see how good things, good desires can become idolatrous in nature if they, they fall into these qualifications? We're willing to sin either because we want it or sin because we didn't get it or, or they just become obsessive. And this is where I think a lot of us fall. I think this is where some of James' readers were. Because he says, you ask and do not receive because you ask it wrongly to spend it on your passions. You, you just want it to fulfill these desires. 
Well, what's the solution? Which, but by the way, um, I, I like to use, uh, I have these worksheets that I got off the internet. Remember, I'm a, I'm a thief. Steals from other thieves, man. I, I didn't make this up. There's uh, uh, Brad Bigney uh, at, what's the name of the church? Fellowship something? Church? Okay. He's a pastor in Kentucky, right across the border from Cincinnati. Uh, from his website, I get these idolatry worksheets I give to, to folks. And uh, it gives you all these different uh, categories. Read through and see if this is something where you see potential idol in your own heart. This is something you really desire a lot and can see yourself. And we check those things off and then we talk about them. Uh, these potential idols uh, in the heart. And they are so instructive. You have some people come in, you know, a wife whose husband's in sin or has sinned in some way. And, you know, she's showing up like, hey, fix my husband. This, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this one, right? You know, I love being here. And uh, then we start talking about what, what do you both desire? Yeah, we get it. He's, he's, he's been sinning. What, what's your desire? And how does that desire affect your relationship? And they, she starts identifying some idols in her own life. Uh, maybe it's living, my husband needs to live up to my expectations or whatever it might be. And she starts identifying places, desires that are competing with Christ in her own heart. Okay, or flip that around. Idols of the heart, yes. Grace Fellowship Church. If you go to, if you Google, yeah, graceky.org. If you go to graceky.org, I think they still have he still has those uh, idolatry worksheets on that, uh, on that website. Uh, or Google Grace Fellowship Church in Florence, Kentucky? Something Kentucky. Okay. Or Florence or Covington, Kentucky. Okay. All right. Idols of the heart. Or, or you can do this. Is, uh, you could also email me. Is my email in the thing at all? It is. Okay. So you could email me and I could... Uh, I could send you the things that I use too. So either one. I'm telling you, sit down with those, do them for yourself uh, and, and let the spirit work and reveal, yeah, I can see how this, this desire is, uh, it can be a problem for me. It's caused conflict in my own life. So what do we do with these desires? What, what does James recommend that we actually do with these desires? <clears throat> to supplant our desire to please God with a desire for something else is to commit spiritual adultery. So look at verse 4 and 5. You adulterous people, do you know, not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it's to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously of the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? Well, what's James getting at here? How could he call, why would he call uh, people struggling with these desires adulterers? Now, now granted, we, we understand the principle of adultery, but why would he call people who are in conflict with one another adulterers? What's he getting at? Any ideas? Yeah, we are in covenant relationship with God, are we not? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my husband, right? I'm part of the bride of Christ. I am in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And when these desires become more prominent in my desire to honor my husband, who is Christ, I am committing spiritual adultery, right? I'm giving my love away to someone else other than the one to whom I am betrothed. That's what James is saying. That's why he's calling them adulterers. Putting someone else in the place, someone or something else in the place of God is adultery. God wants all of our affection and desires to be set upon him and submitted to him. He's jealous for our affection. So the solution for our sinful desires is to humble ourselves. It's to humble ourselves. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So the solution is to humble ourselves, to confess, God, you have loved me so much, you've given your very own son that I could be in a relationship, a covenant relationship of love with you. I have responded to that love by replacing you with something else. Forgive me, Father. Forgive me. I come to you humbly recognizing this is, this is my sinful, wicked heart. Forgive me. I want to cleanse my hands. I want to purify my conscience. I want to re-establish, recommit to you being my first and only love. Right? And this is something we need to be doing. Something we need to be doing. Walking closely with him in humility will keep our inordinate desires in check. So when we're working with people, we want to find out what are the desires that are driving them. Yeah, so the husband and wife are in conflict. Sometimes, sometimes, they just need to be taught what the Bible says about how husbands and wives are to treat one another. If, if they're really longing to please Christ and they realize, oh yeah, the, the Bible says that? The Bible says wives are to submit to and honor their husbands? Yeah, I, I, I should do that. Sometimes husbands need reminded they need to love their wives. Okay. Usually it goes beyond that. Usually it goes, it goes beyond that because there are desires within that are driving them. And this husband, is, uh, he wants more than anything else to be respected and thought highly of, and there, there's an issue of pride there, whatever it might be. And this wife, she's got some desire that's driving the way she's treating her husband. We want to ask those questions. What's driving that? I want to give you a model for the life of the heart. I got this from Brent Oakwin uh, in Lafayette, Indiana, um, up the road here at Faith Biblical Counseling Ministries. There are other models that work. Um, I, I handed out the instruments in the Redeemer's hands, and he uses the root fruit sort of uh, model. A life is like a tree, and what's going on in the roots? If you've got bad roots, what's going to come out is bad fruit. Uh, if you have good roots grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, planted in the word of God, what's going to come out is good fruit. Okay, that's a, that's a great model. There, there are different ways to model this. I like this one. Um, and so this is one we're going to go with, since I'm the one standing up here. Okay? A model of the life of the heart. So let's, let's just think this through. I think thinking this through kind of visually uh, can be helpful. So you have the human heart. You have our behavior, and you have uh, what Brent calls, uh, or what I would call the state of being. Can you guys see that okay? A little small. The human heart, our behavior, and our state of being. And I'll explain what we mean by that. So, you are interacting with someone, you're friends with someone, you've, you're in a relationship with someone, and their life could be characterized as full of sadness, full of anxiety, okay? Or, of course, could be full of joy and peace. But what's, what's the fruit of the life? What, how would you characterize a person's life? You meet someone on Sunday morning, you're talking, and you find out that uh, it's like, I'm a wreck. It's a wreck. My life is full of conflict. I'm worried all the time. What, what state does a person find themselves in? That state, remember coming off of James here, James said you had all this conflict, you had all this stuff going on because of what was going on within. Your state of being follows after how you think and speak and act. Your life is miserable right now and it's full of conflict. 
you're speaking, uh, you're, you're arguing and fighting with your spouse, uh, your thoughts toward your spouse are uh, ungodly, uh, you're thinking God is not involved, you're thinking God doesn't care, you're acting unloving, you know, whatever the issue is, how, how is the, what's the behavior of your life? How are you thinking and speaking and acting? That's, that is influencing, that's determining the state of your life right now. You see how we're moving backwards. How you think and speak and act, as we just saw from James, is driven by your desires and your motivations and your drives. So let's walk forward through this. Actually, we'll look at the questions down below. You have some questions down there, right? So, is there peace in your life? Do I have joy? Am I miserable? Would I say that there's blessing or there's cursing in my life? What, how, where do I find myself? If I'm talking with someone, where, where do they find themselves? Well, that's going to flow out of their behavior. What are they dwelling on? What are they thinking about? What most easily comes out of their mouth? Didn't, didn't Jesus says what comes out of the mouth reveals what's in the heart of man, right? So what's coming out of the mouth? Is, it, is uh, cursing coming out of the mouth? I mean, I don't mean by that swearing, but I mean, is, is it blessing or cursing that's coming out? What do I talk about? What do I do? What's the fruit of my life? How am I acting? How am I living? We find that out and then we say, well, what's driving that? And that's where you ask the questions of the human heart. What do I believe? What am I committed to? What do I want? What is motivating me? If what is motivating me over on that left side in the human heart is, I want more than anything else to glorify my Lord Jesus Christ. Do you not believe that that will influence how I think, how I speak, and how I act? Of course it will, right? Which will then produce a life that is fruitful. But if what's driving me, my desires, are anything other than that, then how I speak, how I think, how I act will be a result of, it will be influenced by what I'm desiring. Do you guys see that? Does that make sense? What is, what is, the, what is most fundamentally driving me? What do I want? In other words, another way we could say that, we could summarize that whole left uh, human heart by what am I worshiping? What is most important to me? You guys get the idea of worship, right? Worship is uh, what is most important to me. That's what I'm worshiping. So the question is a question of worship. What is motivating me? Let me give you some examples. I, I was working with a couple I may have refer referenced him last night. And he was uh, kind of neck deep in the whole pornography thing. And he, they, they had cut off internet. They had thrown away iPhones. They had, I mean, just, just to, to, to every sort of protection they could find. And he was finding his ways around it. Um, and we talked, right? We, I worked backwards on this thing. I, I didn't put this up on the board and work backwards with him. But in my... <laughs> questioning, you know, we find out well, what state is it. And he's miserable. She's angry. Okay. We work backwards and I'm asking about his thought life. I'm asking about what he's doing with his life, finding out some behavioral things. I could have just stopped there and said, well, try this, try work on, the, try this, try this, give you some behavioral things to sort of work on. But we went one step to the left further. What do you want more than anything else? What's really driving you? And you find out what's going on in this guy's life. He also plays uh, Xbox. You know, he's, he's like 25 and married. He plays Xbox like six, seven hours a day or whatever. Uh, has no direction. You know, he's, where's he going? What's he doing? Never makes any plans or schedule. 
And he avoids conflict like the plague. He doesn't want a thing to do with conflict, right? Let's add that up. Xbox, pornography, no direction, avoiding conflict. He wants a life of ease. He doesn't want anything uncomfortable in his life. He wants pleasure and comfort more than anything else. A, con a, a conflict, a difficult conversation, that's, that's not easy. So I reject, I don't want to go there, right? There was an idol just jumping out of his heart saying, ease and comfort. I want more than anything else in my life to be easy. Okay? And we had to get at that. Because here's the whole thing about idolatry. Idols never satisfy. Ever. Right? Ever. That's why he's miserable. He, he, he had totally bowed down to that idol, served that idol, faithfully served that idol. And that idol just gave him, gave him more misery. That's what idols always do. So we had to reorient his worship from worshiping ease and comfort to worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, who alone can satisfy, right? Does that make sense? My wife and I are, are doing some uh, marriage mentoring right now with a couple. And uh, this came out, out as a fruit of uh, Eric's ministry to us in the marriage retreat in the fall. Uh, we did a Q&A time. Someone submitted a question Eric had given an assignment uh, the night before saying, sit down with your spouse and just share one thing that you appreciate your, about your spouse. Maybe he said three. I don't remember. One or two or three things that you, you appreciate about, about your spouse. We get this stack of questions, and of course, there's no names on them. One of the questions we were going to do in the Q&A time, someone had written, what if I can think of nothing good to say about my spouse? Not a single thing. And I had meant to ask Eric that question in front of everyone so we could hear his response. I got the papers all somewhere in there. He got stuck with another paper. I didn't get a, get a chance to ask it. Uh, but as God's providence would work out, my wife ends up talking to a lady in our church. And she says, we're really struggling. She said, I, I, I even submitted this question. at the." And she says what the question was. And uh, when I hear that, I think maybe she's married to like a drunk, wife-beating, kid-hating, uh, prostitute-visiting, you know, whatever. It's like, who is this? I know the guy. He is sweet, loves his kids, works hard. He's gracious. And, I, and, and we've been meeting with him, and I'm, I'm saying that's not just the outward, and he goes home and he's a horrible. We're talking... How could you not think, and Libby and I gave them an assignment, you know, five weeks into this thing and said, just write down a couple of things that you've learned about your spouse since you've been married that, that are positives. She came back um, and she said, this was the hardest assignment. This was so hard. This was very, very, very hard. I can't believe how, it was just going on and on. And your, your husband's sitting right there. They're like, good night, Right? Now, if all I did was say, change the way you speak about your husband, she needs to change the way she's speaking about her husband. But there is some idolatry there. There are some desires. She thinks she is essentially, she wouldn't say she thinks she's perfect, but she thinks the way she does things, the way she says things, is the right way to do everything, and everyone in her house needs to conform to her. There is this thumping out proud sort of idolatry going on there. I am the one who the universe revolves around. And uh, my wife and I are really trying to work at that with them. Um, but that's, that desire, uh, that drive is influencing the way she thinks and speaks and acts toward her husband. Oh, one more. And this one this is a little more benign, uh, maybe we'd say. Uh, we're working with another couple and uh, love the Lord. Wonderful couple. Very active and involved in our church. And uh, she, we've, uh, as we've kind of worked through this and talked about, she's got issues with anxiety, over, overly anxious um, about her husband and their, their child. And 
as we talked about this, she's identified, you know what? I see my husband. My husband is, a, is an idol in my life in the sense that I cannot imagine possibly going on with life if anything happened to him. Same with my son. I, I just, they have become, and she identified them on her own. And she has said, uh, I need to see the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as supreme in my life. And if, as hard as it would be, and as much as, would, as I would mourn and grieve, uh, if he would choose to take my husband or choose to take my son, uh, I need to hold them with loose hands. Okay? She needs to let go of that idolatry that I must have. I will sin if I don't get. I will sin if I lose this. Right? She needs to let go of that. That's a fundamental issue in the heart. So when we talked about Proverbs 4.23 a little bit ago, guarding your heart, that's what we're talking about. What do I want? What am I worshiping? So this sort of uh, idea of the heart and out of the heart, the desires of the heart comes the issues of life. This has implications for ministry. Has implications. If the heart and its desires are the issue, then what are the implications for our counseling? I've thought of a few of them. I want to hear some from you. You maybe as you're sitting here thinking through, yeah, this means I should be doing this or this means this. What are, what are some implications that come out of, out of this that you can think of? Often the issue is not the issue. Good. And what, what do you mean by that? Um, if, if I'm counseling a couple, for instance, and they're just really, uh, really uh, have a lot of hatred, yeah, hateful feelings for one another, and sometimes the surface level is not, right. it, it, it's not it. It's, it's the beginning of the heart. Right. Could, can you hear him in the back, back there? He, he, was, he was just saying, uh, when you're talking with a couple and there's some issues there, maybe, you know, he throws his clothes on the floor. But the real issue isn't the clothes on the floor, right? The real issue is um, maybe some issue of uh, what she is expecting, what he desires, uh, what's, mo what's most important to her, mo what's most important to him, right? Sometimes the surface issue isn't the main issue. Yes? I just need to reevaluate my own heart every day. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So reevaluating our own hearts. Talking about Proverbs 4.23, James 4, Matthew 15, with our, with our own hearts. What, what's the fruit coming out of my life? And what is that revealing about me? Right? Good. Other implications? Yes. There's enough sin to go around. Um, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I like that. There's enough sin to go around. I may use that one. I'll steal that one too. Um, yeah, the whole idea of, and I, let me reword that. I think what you're getting at is in any interaction, any relationship, I always need to examine my own part of it. There's always some, something I'm contributing, right? Always. It takes two to have a conflict. It takes two. What do, what, what do I desire? And, and maybe I could say, yeah, it, if we really evaluate it objectively, that person's got more sin invested in this than I do. But the bottom line is, Jesus said, remove the plank from your own eye before even trying to address the speck in the other, right? Examine your own heart first. Which, by the way, one of the things I, I, I do sometimes is uh, with a couple, I have a whiteboard in my office, and I'll just, I'll, I'll draw, and I got this from someone else too. Okay, um, probably Brad Bigney, I don't know. But I put a, uh, a guy over here and a girl over here. And uh, um, 
they're looking at each other, right? They each see the other person's, I'm in here because of her, you know, and we're in here because of him. And they're looking at each other. And then I just actually talked to them about redirecting their sight up to God. You want to compare yourself to your spouse and think you come out on top. Now compare yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. And where do you? Now, do you believe there's something you can work on here? Do you believe you have some part of this? Yeah, right? Somebody else said their hand up. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's good to see ourselves as channels for the Lord to both well, give and receive. Mm hmm. Whatever good or bad, you know. Sure. I mean, you give good, but you might have to receive or rebuke or something. Uh huh. And to be genuine, not to go around and think Yeah, not to pretend. Hey, look, you know, uh, yeah, not to pretend. Look, you know, we all know that we all are sinners, right? We, all, we can check that off on the, on the quiz, right? You'd, you'd check the right one. Yes, I'm a sinner. But the temptation is to walk around in church and be like, you know, oh, everything is good. We are fine. My life is all put together, right? And reality is we're, we're, we're broken sinners. And so that ought to give us compassion. We can be channels for other people because they can say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not sitting down next to you as someone who doesn't struggle with sin. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling along with you, and uh, I want to, let's, let's work on this together. You, you had a comment. Mm-hmm. Very good point. And uh, I, I think it's one of the ones I have up here. Uh, and whether you want to write all these down or not is fine. Some of these we've talked about. It's not enough to merely address behavior. We must address the affections. We've got to get to what someone wants, what someone longs for. And this is where we have the opportunity to display the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. That He is worth our affection. He is Lord. He is King. He is Sovereign. He is Master. He is Savior. Put your affection on Him. Right? Instead of these little worldly desires that won't get us anywhere, I need to find out what the person wants. Can I? Oh, go ahead. One of the implications of this, too, that we've gone over is we've got to know the scripture. Yes. You've got to know the word of God, right? Great point. We've got to know what God's word says if I want to use it to minister to other people. And now, lest. Well, I don't want to flip the dial too far because I know some of you are thinking, I can't talk to anybody because I don't know the Bible. You know, uh, let that be a challenge to you to know God's word, to be in God's word, to be meditating on God's word. But one thing you could do is just even just take uh, the notes from this weekend and go back through and read through some of the scriptures we've shared. Those, are, those will be ones that come up when I'm ministering to people, when we're talking with one another. Uh, but the other thing too, let me encourage you. Uh, that as you walk with someone, you can say, you know what, I don't, I don't know where the Bible addresses that. So let me, let me get back with you and uh, let me look for some things Scripture says. There's honesty and genuineness. There's integrity to that, right? Regeneration is a must. This is what was brought up back here. Uh, Paul Tripp uses the analogy of fruit stapling. That is like you got a dead apple tree in your backyard. So you go out and staple on a bunch of new apples to it and be like, oh, look at the beautiful, healthy apple tree. Like, it do not work, right? Well, the same thing happens if the Spirit of God is not within someone. Uh, the best we can do is a little behavioral modification. Regeneration is a must. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. There must be regeneration. The 1 Corinthians 6 reference there, 1 Corinthians 6, 10, it's 10 and 11. He says, you know, he talks about how they used to be this, they used to be this, idolaters, they used to be sexually immoral, they used to be da 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 And then he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you're justified, you're sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Uh, there has to be a past tense to that. Regeneration is a must. And so if you're dealing with someone who doesn't truly know Christ, hasn't truly embraced the Lordship of Christ, you need to preach the gospel to them, share the gospel with them, okay? Christ must be seen as of ultimate worth and beauty. 
This one may be as big a challenge as the one about the Word of God. That is, is Christ of ultimate worth and beauty to you? Is Christ your all in all? Can you show in your own life that when trials have come, you have clung to Christ? He has been all you've needed. Okay? That's the testimony you want to go into with. Christ is all I need. And the promises of God must be known and believed. What does God promise you in his word? You didn't know those. Know that and believe that. And the people we work with, we want to continue to take them to the promises of God. And we're going to talk a little bit about what some of those are uh, this afternoon. So, the heart of the issue is the issue of the heart, right? This is what we want to get to. What, what, what do I long for? What do I want? What does my life revolve around? And that needs to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And every time in any of our lives that it's anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to find ourselves struggling in sin, struggling uh, emotionally. And so we need to repent and put Christ as first and foremost. Okay? Yes? Um, one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, the other implication is that we can't change hearts. Mm -hmm. Only God can change hearts. Right. Yep. So it makes us recognize uh, our own place in humility and the need for prayer. Right. Great point. Uh, you can change no one. Only the Holy Spirit can change. And so we must depend upon the Holy Spirit in prayer. Uh, we must depend upon the Word of God to use His Spirit. And we need to realize uh, at the end of the day, um, it, is, it is God who changes hearts. It is God who changes people. That will keep us from any sort of pride if real change happens. That will also keep you from any sort of despair if you feel like it hasn't happened. Uh, you depend upon the Lord, depend upon the Lord, depend upon the Lord. There are times when I've, I've been working with someone and I'm like, that may have been the biggest waste of an hour I've ever spent. I didn't say anything helpful. Uh, this is like, this is a total waste of time. And you know what? They're changing. You know, like, despite me. It's like they would have done better if I hadn't talked with them. It feels that way sometimes. Other times you feel like you really know what you're saying. You really, you know, I've got some real scripture here. But if there is, if the spirit hasn't worked and prepped the heart and uh, the spirit of God isn't moving, um, it's going to fall in deaf ears. So we need, to, we need to ask, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would bring the harvest, right? Okay, let me pray. Father in heaven, we recognize as those uh, whose hearts um, were born in sin, we recognize, Father, our absolute dependence upon you. We praise you, Father, that you have seen fit to bring us new life. Give us new hearts and take away those stony hearts. Give us hearts of flesh. We praise you for that work, Father. And Lord, we pray as we minister to others, as we speak with others, uh, I pray, Father, that we would be quick to look to what you're trying to do in the hearts of people and minister to their hearts. Um, make us faithful worshipers of Christ who love Christ above all. Bring us to repentance for idolatry in our own lives, Father. We recognize I am an idolater right now speaking in front of idolaters. Bring us to repentance for that idolatry, Lord, and conform us more to our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask in his name. Amen.